Coral identification is a fascinating and rewarding experience, but it can also soak up time and energy. So why should we care about corals? Well, corals are often the foundation species of reefs. Indeed, that's why the phrase coral reefs rolls so easily off the tongue. They build the framework of reef structures on which many millions of people directly or indirectly depend. Reefs protect shorelines and support tourism and fisheries throughout the tropical world. Corals are the structural and ecological keystones of both reefs and their myriad connected habitats. Increasing human population pressure, coastal development and climate change are combining to impact not just on reefs, but on the corals themselves through the increasing prevalence of diseases, coral bleaching, physical damage and ecological phase shifts to macroalgae dominated communities. Despite the fundamental importance of corals to reefs and humans, our ability to assess and monitor the role and status of corals is held back by a lack of capacity to identify them. The Coral Identification Capacity Building Program seeks to address this problem at the root by making available the Coral Finder Toolkit, a suite of easy to use training resources that you are now using. So let's get on with it. The first thing we need to understand is the name we wish to give to corals. In the scientific classification scheme, all corals have a genus and species name. Think of this as being like the make and model of a car. Toyota is the genus, and Prius or Land Cruiser or RAV4 are all species. These species may look quite different, but when you check closely, they have a unique set of Toyota characteristics. In the same way, a coral genus may have many varied looking species, but they all share common genus level characteristics. For example, the genus Acropora has well over 100 species, but they all show a common feature known as an axial corallite. For the early learner, the genus level is the natural learning group for understanding and is the doorway to species level ID. Genus level classification is therefore an attempt to create natural groupings of closely related things. Being able to reliably and consistently recognize corals to genus level is a measure of community richness and can, if done systematically, provide a measure of reef health over time. The Coral Finder lets you learn how to identify coral genera. With field experience and some mentorship, your confidence will grow and you will be able to teach others. Eventually you will begin to see the species and their differences among the genus level similarities. So now that we have some context for our learning process, let's meet the key terms and concepts used by the Coral Finder to separate common coral genera. First, just what is a hard coral? As I am not running a biology course here, we will keep the detail short and sweet. Hard corals are animals with polyps, a simple tube with a hole at one end, the mouth, surrounded by a ring of tentacles. They differ from anemones by having an internal limestone skeleton. The skeleton and the polyps that form it are further distinguished by having a six-fold symmetry. This symmetry is most easily seen in young corals like these juveniles. Look closely for the six dominant spikes in these pictures of newly settled coral skeletons. Known as primary septa, they are the foundation elements of the coral skeleton and are surrounded by further cycles of septa in multiples of six. The appearance of this six-fold symmetry varies with many types of coral. Here, a newly settled coral from the genus Porites shows the same six-fold symmetry. The image on the right reveals that there are six elements, somewhat obscured, by the flowery skeletal detail characteristic of this family. The point is that all hard corals have skeletons and six-fold symmetry, even if you can't see it. This diagram is from the glossary page of your coral finder, 
which you should open up and follow along with. To use the Coral Finder effectively, you need to learn the terms in blue. These terms, and the concepts that surround them, have been culled from hundreds in use by coral taxonomists. So we're making it as painless as possible compared to jumping in the deep end. The Coral Finder is the bridge between our underwater and topside experience of corals. Underwater, we deal with the tissue of the living animal, while topside, we can read books and look at the bleached coral skeleton. The Coral Finder helps bring this all together. And once you learn these few terms, you will be able to recognize around 70 genera. Not a bad return for a few minutes work. So there's the deal. Why not pause this video for a moment while you review these terms? Aha, you're back already. Good to know you are keen. Now we are going to practice using this new knowledge. Refer to the diagram on the glossary page of your coral finder as we go. We already know that hard corals have an internal limestone skeleton. The skeleton is secreted by the tissue that overlies it. This tissue is separate from the skeleton, and in some corals, like this cyanarena, the skeleton can be seen through the tissue when the coral inflates it with water. So the coral skeleton is built by the polyp, which is in effect a drape of living tissue sitting upon a limestone cup of its own design. The message here is that while there are many types of coral, and they may look very different, the fundamental principle remains the same. The living animal is called the polyp, and it lives in its own skeletal cup called a coralite. The purpose of the following images is to familiarize yourself with the basic concepts of coral anatomy. Corals are many and varied in shape and form, but the basic characters that define them remain the same. We are not going to focus on any actual coral names for now. Instead, we'll start with the terms and concepts that describe the living animal, the polyp. So enjoy the pictures and focus on remembering the basic concepts. Each coral polyp has a mouth with tentacles. The mouth of the coral polyp is at the center of the oral disc and can usually be easily seen during the day. When the coral is actively feeding, the polyp's tissue is inflated with water and feeding tentacles surround the mouth. Some coral species will extend their tentacles during the day, but the majority feed at night. In this coral, the mouth and tentacles sit at the end of large, inflated, stalked polyps. If disturbed, the coral can retract this tissue back tight against the skeleton by expelling the water inside, as can be seen in the center of the image. This coral has tentacles that withdraw during the day and are hidden behind grape-like bubbles of tissue known as vesicles. At night, the tentacles expand and push their way through to feed. In corals like this, the underlying skeleton may be completely hidden from view. There are other terms for describing the living tissue of corals, but these will do to get you started. In this photo, we can see a polyp with more than one mouth inside of the coralite wall. It is not unusual for polyps to have multiple mouths. In this coral, the polyps are building meandering valleys with multiple mouths inside well-defined coralite walls. At night, the many mouths become surrounded by hundreds of feeding tentacles that bear stinging cells to capture zooplankton food. Here we see a coral with multiple small polyp mouths set among shallow valleys and ridges that lack well-defined coralite centers. Now we see multiple polyp mouths with no obvious coralite walls at all. There is probably only one mouth per polyp here, but it is not really important. I just want you to recognize the basics of the coral body plan, no matter what it looks like. Note, the mouth and the surrounding area of the polyp known as the oral disc are often a different color from the rest of the coral. This coral belongs to a different family of corals to the specimen seen earlier. The different look of this coral is because ridges of skeleton run continuously between each polyp and the coralite it makes. 
Clearly, there is no wall between the corallites. Now it's time to get below the tissue and learn the terms and concepts that describe the coral skeleton. Again, we are taking the simplified approach used by the coral finder. It gets the job done and will get you in the water identifying corals fast. Don't worry about how different the many corals appear to be from each other. Just learn how to recognize and apply these concepts. So assuming you have read the glossary page, let's do a tour of the coral's skeletal home, the coralite. A coralite wall structurally separates a polyp from others and the coralites they create. It is important to recognize coralite walls as it forms the basis for separating many coral genera. Here we see a group of coralites with separate walls. Check your Coral Finder glossary graphic to get a three-dimensional view of this concept. Now we can see the skeleton equivalent that lies under the tissue. Note the relationship between the polyp and the coralite it creates. In this coral, there is a separate wall for each coralite. Note how the wall acts as a scaffold for other skeletal elements that we'll learn more about soon. Here are some more examples of corals in which the coralites have separate walls. Again, note how while the scale and detail of the coralites may vary, the separate wall structure remains. Now let's look at corals with common walls. Note the absence of a gap or valley between each polyp. With the polyp tissue removed, we can see how each polyp has built a coralite that shares a structural wall. All the other elements of the coral remain the same. Again, check the Coral Finder glossary image to understand what the role of the coralite wall is in 3D. Here is a coral with meandering coralites that share a common wall. And here is a coral with meandering coralites that have separate walls. Now we have an example of a coral with indistinct walls. Note the ridges that flow uninterrupted between the polyps. The wall structure is indistinct or absent, giving the polyps a visual continuity or flow. With the tissue removed, the coralites show that the walls are poorly developed or absent. Being able to recognize common, separate or indistinct walls is easy and an important part of the coral finder's approach to separating coral genera. Here is a coral with tiny one millimeter diameter coralites. Again, note the indistinct walls. Now it's time to reveal an ugly little secret of the coral world. We'll call it Russell's Rule. And it says, just when you think you understand corals, there will be an exception to the rule. The exception here is that some corals produce ridges of skeleton that look like coralite walls, but aren't. Sounds confusing? Don't be dismayed because we're here to help. So here's the rub. Sometimes we need to distinguish between coralite walls and ridges on the surface of the coral colony. Here is one of those examples. Note how the very small coralites with indistinct walls are grouped within valleys, bounded by ridges. Here again, coralites with indistinct walls lie draped around a network of ridges on the colony surface. These ridges, while prominent to the eye, do not form well-developed coralite walls. Note how the tiny coralites flow into each other within the valleys created by the ridges. Don't worry if some of these concepts seem a bit alien at first. They all make visual sense after a little practice. Tough it out for now. It's not far to go. And the rest, as we say in the Coral Finder training movie business, is mainly visual. Now we move on to the final three terms you will need to use the Coral Finder to its full power. Scepter, Costi, and Septocosti. These new terms describe the many parallel ridges that emanate from the center of each corallite, and which can be seen through the tissue of the polyp. The names used for these ridges of skeleton are defined by the relationship to the corallite wall. The parallel ridges found within the wall are known as scepter, when they cross over the wall, they are known as costi. Scepter and costi are often heavily ornamented and can take further descriptive terms like beaded. 
One important distinction to remember here is that corals can have ornament on the colony surface independent of septa or costae. This is a coral with meandering polyps that also have separate walls. Note the large teeth lining the septa. Now we are back with our old friend, the coral with indistinct walls. In the absence of a clear wall, the distinction between septa and costae breaks down. Now we use the term septocostae to describe the linear elements that run between each corallite. In this photo, they are very clear, even through the tissue. Here is another coral with indistinct walls and ridges on the colony surface. Again, the terms septa and costae are redundant and replaced by septocostae. Here's another coral with indistinct walls and septocostae. Note the granular septal teeth. This is just ornament. It doesn't change the concepts we are discussing. The polyp centers are a little obscure, see the blue box, but are defined by thickening of the septocostae as they approach the mouth. This is an example of how we will use these few key terms that you are learning to uniquely describe the characteristics of a coral genus such that you can identify it underwater anywhere in the Indo-Pacific. Let's do that again. Here is part of the description of the coral genus Podobasia from the Coral Finder. Septocosti flow between corallites and thicken near corallite centers. Check. Septocosti at right angle to the colony margin. Check. The few terms you have just learnt are the core language of the Coral Finder. It is these tight descriptions of visual clues that make the Coral Finder work. Now we have another coral with indistinct walls and septocosti that flow between the corallites. But note again, the irregular ridges running across the colony surface. Some corals just do this, and you just need to learn to recognize it as skeletal ornament, and focus instead on the features that help distinguish coral genera. In this case, note how the septocosti flow between the corallites in the valleys between the ridges. OK, here's the last slide. Look closely between the ridges and you'll see the tiny corallites with indistinct walls and septocosti that flow between the corallites. The tangle of skeletal ridges and valleys is just a distraction you need to ignore. As you will discover in later movies, only a few corals have them, but you need to recognize them for what they are something you need to see beyond. Okay, I lied, there is one more slide. But we're almost at the end of this training movie, so here's the good news. Learning to recognize the presence or absence and type of corallite wall, combined with the character of the septa, costi, or septocosti, is all you need to be able to drive the coral finder. And that is all you need to know to ID about 70 genera of hard corals. By mastering the coral finder, you will effectively train your eye to see past the confusion caused by the way corals change shape with environment. Not only that, the coral finder also directs you to the most relevant resources for going to the next level, species identification. In the following movies, we will learn how to use the coral finder to solve real world coral ID problems underwater and how, after the dive, we can confirm and refine our IDs using the Coral Hub. One final word. There are many more terms associated with Coral ID, and these become important when you start to work with the species. But for now, you don't need them. But if you're curious, you will find a useful primer at www.coralhub.info forward slash terms. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next movie.